And can you hear me say that? I've for so long been struggling with my voice, and today's my first day back. Thank you. Thank you for all the prayers that came my way. Um, <clears throat> so on, on behalf of the whole service team here this morning at UNB, we want to welcome you. We also want to extend a warm welcome to Joe Kelly and his wife Linda. We're so happy to have them here. And next week, we uh, have our own Reverend Julie Chai as our guest speaker. So we look forward to that. And then we have our book series that I think we mentioned last week. Um, those are once a month for the next 12 months, so a little bit different format than we've had before. And uh, it's centered on heart-centered metaphysics. And um, those meetings started, or are starting, I think this week is one of the first meetings. If you're interested in any of those three groups that are gonna be doing that, all that information, contact, location, time, are all on a sign-up sheet out in the hallway. So please feel free to look at that information and uh, ask any questions uh, of the hosts that are gonna be hosting those groups uh, if you have any additional questions that aren't clarified there on those forms. All right, also, uh, this uh, today is a script Sunday, so if you're interested in ordering any script cards, script cards are gift cards that you can order virtually any, any business that you want to order a gift card from, um, you can get it. When you get that gift card, a percentage of it goes to the church. You pay nothing more, you get the full value of the gift card, but the church gets a little bonus. And if you're gonna use that money to spend at a, a store anyhow, you don't have to think about it as being a gift for someone, just you're gonna use that money. So if you get the gift card, use your gift card like you would use cash and know that you've got some money back to the church in doing it this way. So that is done today. If you have any questions about that, um, I use that service all the time and it's just a really easy way to get a little extra money to the church. So I'm happy to answer any questions back there at the script table if you're interested in doing that. Um, I think that that's all I have to say at the beginning of the service this morning. Ernie? If you'd like to stand, we'll sing our first call to worship, which is my dedication. <clears throat>
and be seated and uh, we'll just have a follow that beautiful song up with an opening prayer. So I just invite you to close your eyes if that's comfortable, kind of get settled, and we turn inward for just a moment to be aware of the presence, the divine presence here with us this morning. Mother, Father, God, we feel ourselves open to spirit and to this time together to connect. We're so grateful for the beautiful snow leaving that clean white finish. It feels good to have it out there. And we're waiting. We're so grateful for this time together and we look forward to connecting with one another and you through each of us. And so it is. Amen. Please join me in speaking our statement of unity. It's found on the screens together. Peace fills me as I center myself in divine love. And you can stay seated. We'll sing our next congregational song, It's All Inside Me. And as the lights come down, I invite you to turn within, maybe close your eyes, clear your lap if you have anything on it, feel your feet grounded in front of you, flat. Take a nice cleansing breath in and release it slowly, feeling your shoulders lower and relax. Maybe rock your head back and forth just to loosen any tension there so you can get settled in your seat and feel connected, grounded. Another breath in and let go. This morning, the Daily Word talks about wholeness. 
wholeness. Wholeness is my nature, and the truth of my life. I see myself whole, complete, and as a living experience of God. I'm an expression of God. My thoughts fill my consciousness with the divine idea of wholeness. My words affirm this wholeness. Through my actions, I bless the life energy in my body with the right balance of exercise, rest, and nutrition. I live from my wholeness, even if I experience illness. I may receive treatment, but I do not consider myself weak or diseased. I move through every health challenge with faith, and grace. Trusting the experience has come to pass. I remember wherever I am, whatever may be happening, divine life is always seeking to express through me to restore my awareness of wholeness, which is and will always be my true spiritual state of being. I invite you to move into the silence in an awareness, an appreciation of your wholeness in the silence. We are grateful for the opportunity to be aware of this wholeness and are reminded that we are spiritual beings and we are divine and we are whole. And so it is. Amen. Imagine there's no heaven It's easy if you try No hell below us 
above us only sky imagine all the people living for today I imagine there's no countries it isn't hard to do nothing to kill or die for and no religion to imagine all the people living life in peace you you may say I'm a dreamer but I'm not the only one I hope someday you will join us and the world will be as one imagine no possessions I wonder if you can no need for greed or hunger a brotherhood of man imagine all the people sharing all the world you you may say I'm a dreamer but I'm not the only one I hope someday you will join us and the world will live as one Thank you, music team, wonderful. Thank you, Meg. Our, our speaker this morning has been a great friend to our church com community here and just a lovely gift to the greater community as well. You may know him, you may treasure him as we do. Uh, Joe Kelly, please help me welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to come again. And, uh, and I'm very humbled to realize that, uh, you know, the, what I'm going to share with you this morning is really your message. It really isn't my message. It's, it's your message. It's, it's the message that you have been hearing all the time. But sometimes in a voice that you're not particularly used to, it seems a little different. And I hope, <laughs> I hope it'll make sense. So as you know, a, a person who speaks fairly often, not like I get invited around the world or anything, um, it is also, an, um, yeah, as old as I am and as long as I've been a part of this, it's still pretty terrifying. And, you know, a few weeks ago, I had some meditation around what is so terrifying. You know, what, why, what is it? And it's, um, so part of it is because I'm the one who's speaking. Okay, and if I'm the one who's speaking in my head, it says it needs to make sense. <laughs> but, how do I know what makes sense to you? Oh my. Because there's a lot of people who speak in the world that don't make any sense to me. And, and, you know, and so that, that whole, so 
you know, so yes, so you get to join the throng of wondering whether any of this makes any sense. So what I want to talk to you about this morning is um, somewhere in the past couple of weeks, I heard somebody repeat something that they had heard um, that had great meaning for them. And it was, um, if you look for God, or the more you look for God, and the more you will see God. And regardless of what the, the word God means to you, because that word has as many meanings, meanings as there are people in the room, in any room. And I have learned that over my time. And, but the truth of that statement is one that I realized some years ago. Um, you know, after years and years of reading scripture, endlessly looking for truth, um, I recognized that something had happened inside my head, inside my heart, and I was seeing the message of Scripture all around me. And that was a great step for me towards a kind of opening for me that I found very exciting. And I think, and I've probably mentioned this here before, I had an, uh, an event where my family was uh, going to a funeral of a relative um, of my wife's, um, a brother-in-law, and it was in Grand Rapids, and I got out of the car, and I started to walk across the parking lot, and I thought, uh, oh, you forgot your Bible. And there was this voice inside me that said, well, yeah, if you don't have your Bible, no, nobody will know you're a preacher. <laughs> and, uh, and I stopped in the parking lot and thought about that statement and decided, if that's the only way anyone will know, then I don't deserve the title. Because it's not, it needs to not be because I'm carrying some book. It's because of how I project living and being. It's way more important. And it was a, a great milestone for me. And, um, and a great milestone towards some sense of freedom. So, so what I want to talk to you about today, really specifically, is, is that statement, the more you look for God, or the more you look for whatever we call God, the absolute, um, the prime mover. The, or, I had an old friend who's gone now named Glenn, used to call it the big one. <laughs> the big one. And, what am I? I don't know. I've, I'm sure I've said this here before, but Glenn, one time working part of a logging crew that I was foreman on, laid down his chainsaw and started to walk away. Glenn was really, really hard to get to do any work. I mean, he was the laziest and most bizarre character I've ever met in a life of bizarre characters. <laughs> and I said, Glenn, where are you going? And he said, I got to go talk to the big one, Joe. I got to talk about that woman. She's driving me nuts. <laughs> so Glenn goes and walks. And he, you know, his chainsaw is laying there. The rest of us, but I can hear him. Because he didn't walk very far. <laughs> and he's, you got to tell me, you got to help me because, you know, She's crazy. <laughs> a little bit later, Glenn's coming back. <laughs> and I said, Glenn, what did the big one say? 
said, he told me to get my ass to work. <laughs> because, because I was lucky to have a woman at all. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, at that moment, that was an opening in me for me too. Because Glenn, for all his bizarreness, was getting the message, you know? And it doesn't just come the way you think it should, Joe, or through what you think the name should be, or, you know, all of that stuff. And so when I heard this phrase sometime in the past couple of weeks, the more I look for God, the more I find God, the more I see God, experience God. Um, it's been running around in my brain ever since, and, and then things would happen, little things, things that, you know, and I'm going to share some of those things with you. Because there is nothing special about me. I'm just another human being who, you know, because of circumstances in my life, I began to take spirituality seriously. And when I began to take spirituality seriously, my life changed. And I haven't been able to shut up about it ever since. You know, I mean, that's really the truth, you know. And so it, it's, it's exciting to come to a place where, and it always has been here, where the sense of love is so like you can touch it, you know, and that's, that's powerful stuff. Um, so uh, roughly a week ago, somewhere around New Year's, we were in, uh, you know, one of those restaurants in Traverse City that's just a shade above a fast food restaurant. Um, and it, nice place, uh, nice people, and we had a, an enjoyable dinner. And across from us is, it's, it's in the evening, um, across from us is a young couple. I don't know exactly how old, but, but a young couple. And they're noticeable because they're so pretty. <laughs> and, you know, the young woman is quite beautiful um, and, and noticeable. And the guy is even prettier. <laughs> you know, you know, All right. Yeah, yeah. I have rarely seen a guy this pretty, and I'm resentful. <laughs> I have to tell you, it did cross through my mind that there's not a minute in my life that ever was I that pretty. Uh, and so he sort of was watching them a little bit, you know, off and on. And they're being very proper. So whatever the relationship is, and I don't have any idea, um, obviously it's a date of some kind, it seems, but I don't know. Um, as we get up to leave, we start to get up to leave. Um, in the door comes four women, four females. Um, one seems to be a grandmother, one seems to be a mother, and two younger ones are teenager type. They're all blonde. Okay, I didn't say the other two were also blonde. And they're all blonde. And they have big smiles on their face. Um, and they're walking with intention, and they come down the aisle between the seats, and they head right for that table. And at that point, we're standing, and I'm holding Linda's coat for her, and the girl at the table, the young woman at the table, looks up and gets this funny smile on her face, and the guy looks a little horrified. And the two older women say, 
Yes, we're here to join date night. Oh, no. <laughs> and now I'm fascinated. You know, <laughs> this is, this is, you know, I made my living as a therapist. I said, we could do this for years. We could, you know, so, so the, um, and, and, and then they're all trying to f sit down and there's, really seats barely for four, and there's four of them plus the other two. And so they're trying to figure out the seating, and the women are laughing, and, they're, and the guy is sort of not knowing what to do next. And, um, and the, one of the women, I think was the mother, said, oh, don't worry about us. We all have plenty of you know, butt room, and we just need to put a butt cheek someplace. <laughs> and, and I'm laughing, and then Linda joins the group. Um, <laughs> she becomes woman number five, <laughs> and says, yes, there's plenty of butt cheek. We can just put it wherever, you know, all this stuff. And I'm watching the guy, and I, and I said, spoke to him. I said, you know, um, I know that you're looking at this as if this is the biggest nightmare you could ever imagine. <laughs> I said, but isn't it amazing that all these people love you and, and came to share your experience? And I'm going to be laughing about this for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> and when we left, and got in the car, I turned to Linda and said, you know, I think that's an example of the gospel in action. You know, it's a living gospel to carry your love and share it, even when it seems like maybe too much. <laughs> you know? But there was, there was obviously so much love between the people. Um, and they included the, the young man, whether he wanted to be or not, <laughs> whether he had other hopes or not. Um, it, and looking at it that way really was important for me. Um, and to think of it that way. Because there were other ways I could have thought about it. And at other times in my life, I would have. Um, and I didn't want to do that anymore. And so I have to pay attention. A day or two later, I was reading a book, a um, wonderful book written by um, a theoretical physicist. Um, it's a novel and um, not on physics. But it has, it's a novel of great depth, and it's around, um, it, the book is called Three Fires, and I don't know if, it's not a real popular book, I don't think. Um, but this is a deep, deep book about uh, the time in uh, Asia of the Pol Pot regime, and the terrible, terrible uh, things that the peasant population went through. And in it is a story of a young peasant woman whose father and mother were murdered by the soldiers. And 30 years later, the, and this is a book of fiction, okay? So 30 years later, the peasant woman is in the fields and somehow has contact with an older man, um, a bit older than her, and who is pretty crippled up. And she has the feeling that she's seen him somewhere before. And so the good part of the book is her trying to remember where, where, and then she realizes this was the man who, as a soldier, 30 years ago, ordered the killing of her mother and father, okay? 
And that's the basis of the novel. And then there is multiple pages of her trying to figure out how she can wreak revenge um, and get away with it. Okay. Um, and she talks to a couple of people and, and, and gets you know, the advice that revenge is right. It's called for in this circumstance. But in the time that she's you know, struggling with this and trying to figure out how to make this happen and how to get away with it, she also, there's a hint of sympathy for this elderly man, crippled up, lonely, virtually a beggar, uh, in spite of the fact that. Um, and as the book goes on, the woman doesn't know what she's going to do because she really believes she should wreak revenge. And at the same time, she's developed a bit of a little connection of sympathy for this man's condition and this man's life and how lonely he is. And then the book ends and it doesn't tell you what happens next. <laughs> and it's fiction. And I'm sitting with tears in my eyes because I feel like I've just been touched by God. You know, I know revenge. I know resentment and hate. I was in the military. Oh. That was a work of art that touched in me a contact with the spirit of Jesus, with the spirit of Buddha, with the spirit of every spiritual leader that ever has been. And I don't know how the book ended, but maybe it's not the book that's important. Maybe it's how I end, you know, maybe it's how I live. And that book touched me deeply. as deeply as scripture ever did or ever does. And, and what grew in my heart was the realization that the scripture in the book is not what's important. It's the scripture that we live out in our lives. That's what's important. And I don't get to know the end. I get to know, I get to hope, I get to practice. There it is. I get to practice what I'm going to live or try to, to do the best I can. Yeah. Uh, and then we had dinner a day or two ago with uh, our daughter and our son and Lynn and I, but also with this family that our daughter has sort of unofficially adopted. So and I think I've talked about that before here, but our daughter has always been, and there are certainly reasons, uh, but our daughter has always been a person who brought people home. Okay. From when she was a child, 
she brought other kids home. When she was at Michigan State, she worked in a Montessori school, and if she came home, she came home with children. <laughs> yeah, and then I was expected to take them fishing <laughs> or, or do whatever, with, ride, take them with the horses or do whatever. And, you know, and there were great, great moments. <laughs> like when we went fishing and uh, one of the children caught a fish that was about this big. And, and the other child, one of the other children said, so let's cook it. <laughs> so on the way home, I had, they were distracted and I went and bought a little bigger fish <laughs> so that we could so we could cook it. So then when we're cooking it in the pan, all the children are looking at the pan and look up at me and say, isn't it funny? When you cook them, they get bigger. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's one of, one of my favorite, one of my favorite, favorite moments. Um, as a not a particularly good parent, that was a, a stroke. Um, <laughs> But having this dinner with our daughter and this family that she brought this woman, the young woman, home when the, uh, from school. Uh, Kimberly was a, a therapist in the school system for a year or two and worked in the alternative school and brought home a, a pregnant 15-year-old. Uh, with no family and living, you know, on couches in various places, and has lived with Kimberly ever since, and has grown into uh, a family of about five people, you know, three little children. And um, you look at that, I look at that, and I think, how crazy that is. I mean, you know, what are you doing? You're and then I think, if more people did this, the world would be a different place, you know. Stop complaining, Joe, <laughs> because you don't get enough time with your daughter, because she's busy raising children, you know. Wow. I need to pay attention, <laughs> you know. And, uh, <laughs> So there were other things I was going to talk about this morning, but when, on our way here, <laughs> Linda and I got into a discussion. Uh, so sort of, you sort of got that. Linda was telling me a story about um, the dog. She was, was talking about something that had happened in the, with the dog uh, some time ago. And and when she told me the story, the story didn't match what I remembered, okay? So, you know, a wise person would have found the story really interesting. That's a great story, it, you know. I'm glad you remembered that. Yeah, but, you know, I'm a husband, <laughs> so, so, and, with this idea that somehow truth is more important than the entertainment value of a story, if somebody else is telling it to me, by the way. <laughs> because when I tell a story, I expect people to, you know, understand there could be possible shades of... Yeah, shades of expansion to this, <laughs> right? Uh, notice how far I can go around to <laughs> avoid the word lying. <laughs> but, but Linda has telling me this story, and I make the mistake of saying, now you know, that didn't actually happen that way. <laughs> and so, um, as sweet as Linda is, she is stubborn as a piece of granite. And, <laughs> and so a few minutes later, I said, so now are you angry with me? And she said, not overly. 
Yeah, yeah. So I got the message, <laughs> you know, not overly. I said, well, uh, do we need to change plans? And she said, no, you need to live with it. <laughs> <laughs> and we pulled into the parking lot. And, um, <laughs> and I said to her, uh, you know, as a sort of peace offering kind of thing, and being a little bit teasing, I said, well, I love you anyway. You know, meaning, um, you know, trying to, and, uh, and Linda said, well, I'm glad. <laughs> and then it hit me, and then it hit me. That's not the way I should love. I'm gonna love you anyway. The healthy way to say that is, I love you because we're different. And then my head went, you should be doing that with the world. I love you because you're different. Not in spite of your obnoxiousness <laughs> and your obvious slippery hold on the truth, you know, or your ignorance. I should love you because you, everyone, is a child of that that we call the living God, or the absolute, or the big one. I should love you because you're you and different. Oh, man. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> you know? I have more to learn. I have more to learn each and every day. And uh, coming here in places like this is where it can happen. It can begin. And so I encourage each and every one of you to continue, because I'm sure you already have been, but to continue looking for that of God in each and every person that you meet, just because they are. And looking for that of God in ourselves and not denying it and turning away from it because it can't be, because it can't be because it's me. You know, I'm this weird character that has all these weird things that goes through my head. I don't think I'm the only one on the earth that has that issue. You know? And so loving others because they're different and loving me and it's really hard to say, loving me because I'm different. Um, and God's in us all. If there is a God, it's not only in the ones that look good <laughs> and sound good on Sunday morning. It's in everything that lives and much that doesn't. Thank you, Jill. Always so, so happy to have you here and to hear your message. <clears throat> this is now our time of offering. Um, it's the time that we share our financial gifts with the ministry. 
And as children of a loving God, we live in the light of abundance. Deeply grateful for all that has been given and all that is to come. We embrace the good that God provides with joy and thanksgiving. And together we speak our prosperity blessing words, and they are found on the slide. Together, <clears throat> divine love through, through me blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, Mother, Father, God. Thank, Thank you. you, and so it is. You're going to want to sing along. my chair dancing was hidden by the podium there, <laughs> your, your Beatles songs this morning. Um, I want to just, first of all, welcome any newcomers here today. If you are here for the first time, we have information packets available at the back of the, of the sanctuary. 
uh, may be available from our ushers on your way out if you'd like to take one of those packets. We will, as always, have a prayer chaplain here available for private, um, private prayer after the service. They wear an orange name tag. We also have one in the hallway. So please take advantage of that if you'd like individual prayer. And I think that we need to sing a little song for a very special congregant who is 80, 84 years old today. And today, is that right, June? <laughs> 24. Is today your birthday? Today. Oh, happy birthday. So maybe a quick round of happy birthday to June. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear June. Happy birthday to you. And many more. Thank you. All right. Um, and we'll have a, a quick closing prayer uh, before we gather in our prayer circle um, to close the service. So I'll just take a moment to turn within. And we are so grateful, Mother, Father, God, big one, <laughs> for this time together, this reminder that the gospel and Jesus is available to us everywhere, in every experience, especially in the face of those that look different from us and with a different life experience than we have. Therein is that opportunity to experience our wholeness. And for this, we're so grateful. So it is. Amen. So as we join in our closing circle, please feel free to hold hands or just in your heart hold hands if you would rather not because of the season of all the things going around. Please feel free to do that. We'll join in our circle for our closing prayer for protection. need to move in just a little bit. Oh, we can't make it. Oh, what's happening? <laughs> All right, let's take a moment to uh, put into the circle any private prayers or not so private. Uh, if you'd like to speak any names or circumstances uh, into the circle for group prayer. Tracy and Angie. And we hold the highest outcome and good for each of these people and circumstances in our hearts. And together we speak our prayer for protection. The light of and God goddess surrounds us. us. The, the love of goddess God enfolds us. us. The, the power, power of goddess God protects us. And the presence of goddess watches over us. Wherever we are, she 